Welcome back to the Foreign Book Club. We're going to continue and complete our discussion of George Weichel's book, The Next Pope. Next week, we'll have George Weichel with us, God willing, and have a kind of summary discussion. Now we're going to finish the second half of the book. And uh, I, I found the tone of the second half to be more, a little more moral exhortation than the first half, although there was some of that in the first half, too. Uh kind of like encouraging remarks to the next pope and how we should uh, have dealings with bishops and priests and religious and the lay people. Uh, anyone want to start with something or shall I jump in there? I I have nothing until the bottom of 81. 81, that's pretty soon. Well, Maybe. Oh, uh, yes. Well, I, I was going to say, Father, that he does have very specific policy sorts of recommendations that he makes in these chapters. He does. That's right. Very I do think so. the second half, second half of the book is, is very practical in a good sense of the word, you know, actually addressing problems which anybody who knows anything about what's, ha what's been happening in the church over the last 40, 50 years knows the problems that need addressing. And I'm really pleased this book's been published because uh, you know these are exactly the sort of sorts of things that Catholics need to be expecting the next pope to be addressing. Page eighty-one, Joseph. What do you have there? Well, just at the bottom. Uh, so, bishops of a church in mission must be radically converted disciples who have demonstrated in their lives a personal conversion to Jesus Christ and a conscious choice to abandon everything to follow the Lord Jesus. And the reason I've actually plucked that out and, and highlighted it, you might think it sounds obvious. You know, bishops need to be devout Catholics <laughs> living the life of faith. But, you know, we, we know that so many of them are picked as bishops because they're good administrators. You know, they'll, they'll look after the funding, look after the finances. You know, and, and that's not what you want the bishop. To, you know, the bishop can delegate that stuff. The bishop, first and foremost, has to be on fire with the faith and in love of Christ. And, and that really has to be the criterion that, that supersedes all other criteria. Um, and, and that's, I think, is largely has been forgotten. You know, we, we're basically getting administrators to run the church. We don't need administrators to run the church. We need saints running the church. You're distracting me, Joseph. It's such music to my ears when I hear someone who uses the words criterion and criteria uh, in the same <laughs> sentence and gets them right, you know. Well, thank you. I'll do my best. Yeah. Uh, so to that, to that point, Joseph, his recommendations on page 83-84 about broadening consultation with the laity, um, you know, my question is, would that help? Uh, I suppose it depends on which laity you consult. Because we have a tendency, at least in, in modern America, to be kind of craven to experts. And if you only consult, you know, professional experts in these fields and that fields for your bishop appointment, you know, um, the, the likelihood that that's going to favor a man with these sort of managerial skills and that kind of thing. But if you were to go ask, you know, the, the, the bad ladies in the church who are in there all day praying their rosaries, or the mothers of large families, or uh, the firefighters up in Sonoma County, or, you know, the more uh, rank and file, what kind of man they want to be their spiritual leader, I think you would get a different kind of answer. Exactly Absolutely. the point. And I, oh, go ahead, I, 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 Yeah, sorry. I, I think the whole idea about lay consultation here is really about having the laity doing some of the functionary stuff. In other words, the bishop shouldn't spend every day in meetings um, dealing with administrative, bureaucratic stuff. That is stuff that could and should be delegated to, 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 to lay people. Because again, the, the, the priests ideally should be concentrated on ministry, um, not the, the administrative life of the, of the church, which does need to be dealt with, but it doesn't have to be dealt with by the clergy or the bishops. Well, it, in, in some sense, because of its hierarchical structure of authority, the Catholic Church will always be kind of an old boys club in the sense that bishops ultimately the ones recommending the episcopabili priests who are, could become bishops, and the Pope and those who are working with them are the ones that make the final choices. So that 
we can't really get around that, but Vivian, I had the same reaction uh, when he says on page 83, reform must include broadening the consultations that lead to a mass nomination with the fisk debate on 84. Sh competent, shrewd lay people must be asked confidentially about this or that potential economy for the Episcopate. Ways to consult the lady in the nomination of bishops must therefore be devised. Well, we have a, a, a concrete example of how that can work or not how it cannot work in Germany with the Synodal Way because there the bishops have actually uh, joined with this uh, the Catholic Central Committee. I mean, that, that's got to be ironically named. Uh, and that central committee is known for all its positions on promoting homosexual unions, on uh, removing the celibacy requirement, or dating women. So are you going to consult them? So in a certain sense, vicious being human beings are going to consult the people that they think are worthwhile, namely who think like them. So how do we solve that? Well, uh, I think... The more good bishops who are appointed uh, will be bishops who spend time with people, who know some families, who visit parishes or have been parish priests for a long time, and who know who the Catholics are, the lay people in their dioceses, uh, that would be good, would give a good advice. For example, I helped with a local pastor here, Father Ilo, Star of the Sea, organize a building committee uh, to do some a project on the parish grounds. And I am so impressed by the people he was able to appoint on that committee. Uh, these lay people are very, very solid in their Catholicism and extremely competent. You know, one's, one's a finance person, one is a construction guy, uh, you know, another one is a lawyer, another one's an accountant. And I, oh my, I didn't realize this is kind of a small parish and it's not really in the, in the high level, high rent district. Said, well, everything's high rent here, but uh, it's not in the posh district, let's put it that way. And yet, so there, there are lay people out there, and I think a good priest will know them. And yeah, I think, I, think, I think that that's what I was trying to say. Certainly not the German model, uh, you no, know, of democratizing the church where the, the, the hierarchy can't do anything without approval from the laity. That's obviously a, a recipe for anarchy. But um, but certainly that that what we, need, we need prudence being used uh, and courage by the by the bishops to to delegate. Uh, that some of their administrative powers and functions to qualified laity. And the example you just gave, you're building, you have a building fund where you have a, a construction person, a legal person, and an account, accountant, you know, to make sure that everything's running to budget. I mean, you put the team together that's necessary, and the bishop then can not so much walk away, but at least just keep an eye on things from a distance and concentrate on other things. And also, by being part of that committee when it's meetings, he can kind of... Uh, size up the lay people and know who she, whom he should seek out for advice when it comes to time to name other potential bishops. In this same chapter, he talks about the cardinals, and he says that, uh, page 87, uh, recommends that the College of Cardinals meets with some regularity. And something I thought about some years ago, uh, when we had the Second Vatican Council for four straight years, all the bishops of the world were in Rome for two or three months at a time, getting to know each other, eating with each other, having discussions. And so when it, when Paul VI died, uh, those bishops knew each other. And they chose John Paul I, who died, but then they chose uh, Wojtyla. Why Wojtyla? Wojtyla was known to them. He was part of the commission. She was there. Likewise, uh, after, and, and Wojtyla especially helped to internationalize the, the, the College of Cardinals, so you have more cardinals spread out all over, the, all over the globe that don't see each other very often. But when uh, John Paul II died, most of the bishops who were, were then cardinals, let us say most of the cardinals at that time had been bishops or very active in the church during the Second Vatican Council, so they also knew who those people were. And so they, they elected Ratzinger. It, this previous uh, conclave in 2013 brought together an international group of cardinals who did not know each other that well. 
And you can't expect them to vet each other, you know, in a weekend or in a period of a week. So I think it's important, as, as George Weichel recommends here, is that the College of Cardinals be as it is now international. That's important. But that there be some more frequent meetings. It's difficult to have to leave your diocese and leave your country and go to Rome for, for a week or so. But I think for the governors of the church, it's important. Yeah, again, and if, if, if we have a system of, shall we say, subsidiarity on the local level, where the bishops uh, and cardinals are not actually hands-on with every single minute detail of the, the, the running of their dioceses, um, they, they, they won't be as missed when they go, go and do what they're supposed to be doing in the College of Cardinals and getting to know each other. Amen. Anything else on this chapter? Let's move from bishops then to priests. I, uh, there are some obvious and some not so obvious uh, critiques that he makes of various current events and persons. On page 93, he's talking about the importance of the Pope affirming the celibacy of his priests. Uh, and he says, a new paragraph there, one way the next pope can offer that encouragement and support is by affirming the gift that priestly celibacy is to the church. And the next pope should explain the nature of that gift to the entire church so the church can explain it to the world. And then it is sometimes said, even by senior churchmen, that is other bishops and cardinals, that celibacy makes no sense in certain cultural conditions. That is, of course, true if the cultural situation in question is pagan or post-Christian. The sacrifice involved in celibate love and the gift that such self-sacrifice offers to God and to the church only makes sense in the context of the kingdom present among us. And here's the final sentence. And if the gospel of the kingdom has not been proclaimed, whether in the rainforest of Brazil or the cities of Germany, the celibate form of paternal love will make little or no sense and so th that's an obviously direct dig at the Amazonian Synod, where the excuse was made by mainly German prelates. Oh, well, these people have a different culture. They can't understand celibacy. Therefore, we must eliminate it, you know, and ordain very probati, mature men. That's why I called it the Boys from Brazil Synod. <laughs> but, you know, that, that, of course, was what um, that beautiful book that Ignatius published with Cardinal Lorenza and Pope Emeritus Benedict, which did affirm and explain the gift of celibacy. And really, uh, some priest told me that it advanced for him a theology of celibacy, that this was actually, yes, something that the church has always had, but not always been that well explained. And then when this priest was in seminary, he said that there really wasn't a deep and profound explanation of it that he found in their book. And so let's pray that that book is part of this process of giving this gift to the next pope. That's right. That book is from the depths of our heart uh, by Colonel Robert Seurat and Pope Emeritus Benedict. It's a wonderful book. It really is. Um, I'll say one thing as well, just a, 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 a personal experience, which I think sort of encapsulates where we need to get things right. I, I've, I've stayed at two seminaries when I've been given talks um, where the actual seminarian rooms, they share a bathroom. Um, so in other words, that the seminarians could be having a, a relationship, an inappropriate relationship, uh, and nobody would ever know because they, they, they've got access to each other's room without actually going outside. Um, and it's, I, I'm not saying that that was deliberate, that these seminaries were designed that way, although I'm tempted to. Um, but the point is that if you want to avoid uh, a culture that's going to be pernicious and poisonous, don't facilitate it. That's called avoiding the near occasion of sin. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> You know, on this point, um, you know, he says on page um, uh, 91 in the middle that priests who truly believe what the Catholic Church teaches, 
um, are not sexual abusers. And I wish that were true, but I know that there are some very deeply wounded men uh, that, uh, in spite of what they believe on a faith level, um, and 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 so I just I we, we I do I think that it's true that over time, if you're living in a constant state of immoral actions, that it will erode. Uh, your faith over time, or could, but I think there are these very conflicted people, like Oscar Wilde, right, Joseph? I mean, there's this uh, inner conflict going on in them that uh, needs to be addressed. I'm not saying that fidelity to the faith isn't important and shouldn't be a starting place for anyone's vocation, but I just want to stay clear of oversimplified uh, well, I do think I do think that obviously there that there are uh, priests that, are, that were orthodox that that uh, were are amongst the abusers, but there was a large there was a culture of basically saying there's nothing wrong with masturbation, with homosexual relationships, and you don't have to feel guilty about it. And they were taught that in the seminary, and the, uh, sex was only taught in terms of psychology, not in terms of theology. Right. Um, and you know, and yes. the consequence of that, we we we've seen the fruit of of that. You know, so I yes. think that is in many ways the root of the problem. Of course, you're not going to have a, a sin-free clergy, uh, and you're not going to be able to have um, uh, chastity across the board at all times with everybody. But what you have to do is make sure that people know that this is a mortal sin, that you'll go to hell, that you need to go to confession, and also, sorry, that uh, we're going to put you somewhere where you're not able to do that again. I mean, these are just, this is a, a baseline, you know, and, 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 and the trouble was that that was all neglected. It, it was, but also when you look at the, uh, you know, when the uh, statute of limitations was lifted on, on sex abuse cases in California, only on the church, by the way, some of these cases went back 60, 70 years. And so in any case, I agree with you. Uh, Father, you might have something to say about this. Well, I will say this. I, I confess to a lack of imagination here. But it's hard for me to picture a priest who is celebrating the divine office every day, office of readings early in the morning, morning prayer, midday prayer, evening prayer, Compline, and celebrating Mass faithfully every day. You know, going from Compline into some guy's room and buggering him, I just, it's, I, 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 sure it's possible, but I, I, would, I would be pretty sure that if they could do a study on this, that those priests who are really faithfully living their priestly life day in and day out were not, were not part of these abusers, at least not you know, Vivian, we, we know a very fine priest who, on one occasion, one moment in a swimming pool, put his hand where he shouldn't have. Well, okay, that can happen. He repented. He went to see a psychologist. Uh, but, of course, it's, it's almost ruined his priestly life now. He's, he has no faculties. Right. But that's that's a different thing from the kind of regular uh, solicitation and abuse that took place in so many you cases. You know, Father, you really put your finger on something that I think is related to what Joseph said. This paragraph that I was taking issue with was because he was saying people who believe thus and so. And I think a really critical thing that got lost in this era was the downfall uh, of discipline. In other words, you can believe all the right things, but if you don't live a disciplined life, you're going to open yourself up to these temptations more so than, than not. And so what you just said, Father, you know, if a priest is faithful to prayer morning, noon, and night, and, you know, if he's doing that, that requires a discipline. It requires a discipline that's taught in the seminaries, exampled in the seminaries, and that's exactly the thing that got lax during the period with adjoining bathrooms. <laughs> yeah. So it... it you need the belief, yes, but you also need the disciplined life. I mean, we, the, the phrase in the Reformation, sola fide, right? The, by faith alone. You know, just just, just um, being orthodox in your belief is not going to stop you from, from becoming a miserable sinner. 
unless you're actually putting those beliefs into practice. Exactly. In your daily life. Exactly. There's one other element at the very end of the chapter here, which is, uh, this is more an indirect criticism he's making. Because throughout the book, he's talked about the place where the church is alive and vibrant and the place where it's declining and, you know, be becoming degraded. Of course, he never says how you can tell which ones are which, except he does say growth versus decline. But it, on page 99, New Paracope, he says, the next pope must recognize the truths behind these contrasting patterns of renewal and collapse. So those are the two alternatives he sees. And their relationship to gospel fidelity and infidelity. The, the last sentence, and if necessary in exceptional cases, the next pope must himself take action in the life of religious communities that have shown themselves resistant to the reforms necessary to restore their capacity to be heralds of the gospel and witnesses of the kingdom present among us now. Hmm, I wonder who he's thinking about in that. <laughs> anyway. Well, Father, I'm, I'm, I'm champing at the bit here um, okay. because I know that we've, this is our final session before we have the, okay. the author as a special guest next week. Now, I do want to make sure, I, I'm, but I'm not going to, you know, you can do what you like, but I, I, I would like to make sure we have sufficient time to discuss the chapter, the next Pope and the reform of the Vatican. Okay. Page 110, because I do think the curia is the really big issue. Um, and uh, I, I, I would be, uh, I think it would be remiss of us if we ran out of time before we got there. Okay, well, I, I think the curia is a big issue too, but the solution is a simple one that he says. So, but well, let's, let's, let's do quickly then. Uh, we do not want to disadvantage the lady, of course, Joseph and Vivian, because the next <laughs> chapter is on the lay apostolate. Um, uh, he, you know, we've noticed this already. He has kind of a somewhat negative view of the period between Trent and Vatican II. Uh, so we'll talk about on page 101, uh, top of the page, counter-Reformation Catholicism understood, quote, the church in strictly hierarchical terms. Lay Catholics were located firmly at the bottom of the pyramid in which both authority and initiative flowed in one direction from the top to the bottom. Well, at the very end of the chapter, on page 109, in the middle paragraph, he says, the Pope must also remind the entire church that while lay men and women can, can and should perform many important services within the church, there is nothing more important for lay Catholics to do than to be heralds of the gospel and effective witnesses to Jesus Christ in the world. A vocation that will often include marriage and begetting and evangelization of children. Now this sort of on the side, you know, or something goes along with being a herald. But what was happening in the so-called Counter-Reformation Church? Lay Catholics were getting married, staying married, having children, teaching them to pray, sending them to Catholic schools. I mean, you want a better lay apostle than that? There is not one. Right. And, and the Counter-Reformation Church was, was the great evangelizing church that, 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 that evangelized the world with those great Jesuit missionaries, amongst others. Um, um, and, you know, it really, I th I, my, my, my issue really is I think he's conflating too simply, and it's a temptation we all have, uh, the, 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 the sort of Pio Nono uh, reaction to the loss of the papal states uh, you know, the, 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 the Napoleon and 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 um, you know the, the church basically being crushed in a secular sense of all of its political power, uh, but that's a very brief period. You know, we're talking about you know sixty or so years, uh, and and quite frankly, even then, I think that the popes were heroic in their in you know in their response to to, to that tyranny, um, and. Uh, I don't think you say, well, you know, they, they sort of became ghettoized. Well, they were they were basically placed in the ghetto. <laughs> and they didn't become ghettoized. They were put in the ghetto, right? Right. Well, and when I was young priest here in California in the 70s and 80s, I used to give a lot of retreats. And we have a lot of Irish priests and nuns in California. Matter of fact, over half the priests in the California in the – Early 1900s were born in Ireland, half the diocesan priests. So I made a practice of asking these nuns, when I had an Irish family, I said, well, sister, uh, you are born in Ireland? Yeah. How many children in the family? Oh, there were eight. Uh, did you pray the rosary every night? Oh, yes, of course, Father. How many priests were released? Well, I got two brothers who were priests and a sister who was a nun. And I had that happen 
Time and again. Yeah. Time and again. One oh. of my, my, my mother-in-law uh, was born in Northern Ireland, uh, and uh, um, that one of her brothers is a priest. So, yes, I have a priest in the family via the Irish side of it that I'm married into. Yeah. Uh, one other quick thing here on page 105. Uh, he talks about a clericalized lady mistaking lay responsibility in the church with office holding and church bureaucracies is not going to advance the new evangelization. So the idea that you're more, you're more Catholic as a lay person if you are working in the chancery office or something like that. He does not mention liturgy here, though, but that's another thing. You know, it doesn't make you a holier layperson because you're a lector or a greeter or an extraordinary minister of Holy Eucharist. I mean, that's a noble thing to do. It's true. But Vivian, I remember when you, when you bring your kids to church, you know, and Mary was crying or in the back of the church, nursing or whatever like that, or, or, or Thomas. Uh, were you not really fully being part of the lay apostolate because you were not up doing lecturing? Of course not, you know. In fact, I I, uh, I wished I could tell the women, would you please sit down? <laughs> don't you do enough at home already? I sure do. I don't feel put out one bit that I don't have to do anything up there. I'm perfectly happy to be served for a change. <laughs> but um, wasn't there a joke, Father, a while back in the uh, spirit of Vatican II era that the women want to be priests, the priests want to be married, and the married people want to get divorced. <laughs> Everybody good. wanting to do what, you know, the grass greener on the other side, uh, you know. And so in any case, I think a lot of that has been tamped down as we reaped the harvest of what this has brought about. But I do want to point to something on page 103, that I think is a segue, Joseph, into the chapter on the Curia. And that is um, where he talks about baptism often understood as an institutional initiation rite, a sacrament to be sure, but also a tribal or ethnic welcoming ritual. The Council's theology of the universal call to holiness called all Catholics to appropriate the meaning of their baptism in full, to be configured to Christ. And as you've said before, Joseph, it not, it's not as though this is a new teaching, right? but, but there, there was and, and continues to be what we call cultural Catholicism, right? Where people get their children baptized just because that's what we do in this family. That's what we do because we're Irish or Italian or what have you. Same thing for confirmation. Same thing for marriage in the church. And while there's a kind of strength to having a society that's all doing the same thing, because that gives mutual encouragement for you to do the right thing, by the same token, the weakness to that is that it becomes just a rite of passage. And well, not I think it's unavoidable. The extent to which Catholicism is successful yes, yes. Is, is, is going to actually become uh, at a grassroots level diluted. I mean, if everybody's That's a Catholic, right. you know, then everybody's a Catholic. In other words, that you know, the miserable sinner and um, everybody else, they're all going to be baptized because everybody's baptized. And of course, it's going through the motions. It's what you do. It's like the Italians would still say, you are in the survey, 97% are Catholic. You know, um, but what does that actually mean, right? Right. Right, but the, the segue into the next chapter is when he talks about reforming the curia and saying that personnel is policy, uh, he says it a number of times, you know, your, your personnel, of, of course I'm Catholic, I was baptized, of course I'm Catholic, I'm Italian, of course I'm, I mean, this is always going to be a challenge. Uh, this is always going to be a challenge, and that, that's all I wanted to point out about that. Okay, I want to make I... a brief, a, just a brief interruption of the segue, though, because I do want to say one word about uh, page 106. He talks about the Marian profile of the church and that the Petrine office, the authority of the church, must take place within the Marian receptivity, where all must be conformed to Mary. It's a beautiful idea, and it's, it's very Balthazarian. That, that's, a, that's a big theme in von Balthazar, the, the, yes. sim, the symbolism of Peter, authority, and Mary, 
the faith and receptivity towards God. So now we now we can segue in to the next chapter, the unnumbered chapter. I call it chapter nine, though. Uh, the next pope in the reform of the Vatican, in page one eleven, he says, "While important for reasons of efficiency, this is the new paragraph at the bottom. The design of the Roman Curia is of less consequence." than the character of the men and women who work in it. And that, I think that says it all. You yeah, I, 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 I highlighted that passage and uh, because that's exactly it. We actually need men of faith and, and more to the point, men of sanctity working in the Curia. We don't want bureaucrats and we don't want, quite frankly, pernicious individuals and corrupt individuals on all sorts of levels, which has been the case for, for a while. And the, the, one, the one thing that sums up my, my, my view on this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vent <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, that, that, uh, the, 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 he, he, he's much more, George Weigel, the author, is much more charitable perhaps than I would be here because the quote that he uses to, to, as an epigraph to actually open the chapter about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples and we all should, should learn to do the same is true, right? But it's universally applicable. With the Curia, quite frankly, I would have employed the uh, the gospel passage about Christ clearing up the money changes from the temple because I think that that that's exactly where we are now with this. That we need we need a pope that's going to come and say, look, we have to do what's necessary here. We have to scour scour the shire, scour the curia. You know that the, 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 the time for, for kid gloves is over. Um, we've got to just sort this out now. And I I, I would be quite happy. I and mean, I've been quite Pope Francis. My sort of hope was at the beginning that was what he was going to do. Um, hasn't happened. Um, my, my hope is if the next Pope does nothing but clean house in the Vatican, he would have done a great service to the church, regardless of what else he may or may not do. Okay, but I, will, I want to speak here from my personal experience, as they say. For a period of about 20 years, I was in the Vatican visiting two or three times a year, meeting with various, various people. At that time, uh, I knew especially the uh, the American priests who were working in different congregations, like Father Charlie Brown was at CDF, and Father Jim Conley was the congregation of bishops. They're both bishops now. Uh, but And Father Fuccinaro, the congregation for, the, for worship. And I, I got to know some of the cardinals, like Arenze and, and, and Seurat and Ratzinger, of course. And Ouellette was, is a priestly friend of mine. So I, I had a lot of contacts at various different levels in the Roman Curia. And I have to say that by and large, I mean, these were people who were very deeply Catholic, uh, well-educated, very sacrificial, doing good work. I mean, I had a very, very high regard for overall. But they would also tell me about others. And I've met one, I won't mention his name, who was, who was, a, um, let's see, a, he was a bleep liar, you know, I mean, I absolutely just lied, it lied in a way that was, that was very detrimental to me uh, and to, to Ignatius Press. Just a bald-faced lie and a big lie. And he wasn't alone. And then yeah, several I, others I, 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 Some of those people you know, I don't know any, any, anywhere near as, as, as many as you do, but I know some of those people, and I agree. They're, they're, they're very no, and I, I was very encouraged, in fact. I was at, at a party once in the Vatican of North American priests who were responsible for helping to select bishops, and I thought we're in safe hands here. You know, I I, I really thought that. But you know, but the but the but the uh, the corruption runs deep there. I mean, to the Vatican Bank and 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 the sort of things going on, on on there. And and these these bishops are sort of they're great. I mean, we need more of them. But then then they're on the surface of something that the deeper you go, the murkier it gets. And Cardinal Pell, I think, was sort of was actually heroically trying to dig. Yes. Some of the dirt there, yeah, you know, and I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but he was taken out, you know, oh. taken down, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and, and, and it's scary, quite frankly, it's scary that the, what, the power that some of these people might have. And I don't want to be into conspiracy theories, but we do need uh, a, a, a pope that's going to have the courage to take these people on. Well, me, well go ahead, baby. Well, I, it, well, it's true that this is. When you said for, for some time, you might as well say from the beginning of the church, because <laughs> let's not forget that Judas was at the Last Supper and he controlled the money bag. <laughs> and I don't think it's really been much different ever since that where there's money, where there's power and influence, you will find corruption. 
which is not to say that you should do nothing about it, but I think it helps to have a kind of realist view of the situation. When I first visited Salzburg, Austria, and I saw the gorgeous palace that the Archbishop of Salzburg built for his mistress and 12 children, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's the one that in the sound of music, they're all dancing around the fountain. Yeah. yeah, that's the Archbishop of Salzburg's palace that he built for his mistress and 12 illegitimate children. Okay, so I'm just saying there's, I'm not saying that we do nothing about that, but it helps well, I'm, to have... I'm, I'm saying, I'd be, I'm saying that, we, that, that, that that sort of response would not be permitted as regards the sex abuse crisis, and it should not be permitted as regards the Vatican Bank. You know, that basically that there, there are laws of accounting, yes. auditing, uh, and, and the same laws that are applicable across the whole world and the secular world as regards auditing fund, m funds should be applicable to the Vatican. Well, I agree. I do remember, though, right after becoming a Catholic, this was in 1980, there was an article in the paper right about the same time of some ba Vatican banker being found hanging from a bridge with a noose around his neck, right? right. You know, Black and somebody Black actually Black Black said to me, Black and Black you want to... What? Likewise, bridge in London. That's yeah, right. yeah. And you want to say, someone said to me, this is the church you want to join? You want, <laughs> And I want to say, this is the human race you want to be part of? I mean, what is your point exactly? I'm not saying don't do anything, not at all. But well, let me anyway. Turn, let me just balance this with a, with a, a, a good story about one priest uh, who worked in the Vatican office. I think the most important office in the Vatican is the one that helps appoint bishops, the congregation of bishops. He's an American priest, and in the time I knew him was the time in the United States when most of our bishops were fairly liberal. And so when they pre presented their turna to Rome of the three names that they thought could be the next bishop of whatever open diocese there was, what he would do with his friends, he'd go through the background, and they determined that none of those three names were any good. And so what he would do, they do their research, and they'd send back to the noon show this letter saying, well, we have found difficulties with each of your three names. Uh, please review your process and consider this priest. You know, and of course, because the way things work with the nuncio, if Rome says consider this priest, he gets on the turn up. And then that's the one they chose. So it was a it was a fantastic thing it was done by basically one priest. Uh, and we have there's a lot of bishops right now in the U.S., a lot of good bishops that are here because that priest did the right thing. The power of what one good person can do is, 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 is true. I, I would not want to gainsay it. Yeah, okay. Uh, onward, I guess, to, let's see, ecumenism in religious dialogue. What do we want to say about that? Well, well the, one, the one thing I, 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 did, I did highlight... Uh, the passage of 119 uh, to, to 120, perhaps you won't read the whole thing, but he talks about the etymology of the word tolerance, which is to bear with. Uh, and the way that he describes that, I think, is very good at the top of page 120. He says, true tolerance is engaging the other, in other words, the person who disagrees with you, within a bond of civility, in a mutual search for the truth of things, including the religious truth of things. This is admittedly a difficult lesson to learn, but the world must learn it. And, you know, and, and you've heard me say this on here before. The trouble when you do a book club with the same three people for however long we've been doing this now, you know, the same um, favorite saying has come out. But I think this is absolutely applicable here. One of my favorite sayings of, of Chesterton, when he talked about his relationship with his brother, we were always arguing, but we never quarreled. And, and the, the, real, the real test of tolerance is if you know the difference between arguing and quarreling. And now, the, basically, you know that you, you can't argue about anything because you're offending somebody, right? So that, so that we ha actually have a, a, a cancel culture because no one's prepared to bear with, in the, the traditional etymological understanding of the word, bear with the views of the other. Again, the words of Voltaire, I may despise what you say, but I would defend to the death your right to say it. That's been lost. Yes, That's it the is. the tolerance that we're talking about here. Yes, it is. I would just call attention to two kind of themes in this chapter. One is that he suggests that in ecumenical dialogue, we uh, forget 
the attempts to have kind of higher level meetings with the mainline Protestant churches uh, who are who all floundering. And instead, we should have our dialogue with the evangelicals, uh, you know, fundamentalists and Pentecostals and so on. And it's certainly true in the pro-life movement. I mean, Catholic pro-lifers and evangelical pro-lifers stand shoulder to shoulder, support each other, pray for each other, defend each other. And I think that's, that's much more fruitful as an ecumenical encounter than having a commission, I, you know, with the Anglican Church. I, yeah, I think I think that George Weigel says somewhere, perhaps the Pope doesn't need to be involved in the sense that this is happening in the pro-life movement anyway. Let it happen. My my only uh, my only uh, part what? about that chapter I didn't like is that the the, 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 the suggestion that somehow that the Church should declare war on on, on Russian Orthodoxy, um, you know that uh, and the whole idea that you no know, it. it the, the, the presence of Russian orthodoxy in Russia is what's stopping Russia from becoming communist. Um, it, the, it, the Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn is compulsory reading in every high school in Russia. And I am going to um, resist any effort to resurrect the Cold War against what is effectively in Russia a conservative regime. Might be a corrupt regime, right? I'm not, I'm not suggesting that it's not corrupt. Um, but it, it's certainly in terms of radical relativism and, 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 and the gender agenda and the rest of it, it's much healthier than we are. And I'm not going to tolerate the resurrection of the Cold War. So the whole idea that the church to somehow sort of turn its nose up at the Rus Russian Orthodoxy, I'm not comfortable with. Well, yeah, I think part of this is due. I mean, George Wagner knows a lot more about these things than probably all three of us put together. But he has been very active in Poland and Ukraine. Uh, and he kind of has the Ukrainian view, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Autocephalous Church of the Russians, you know. And I remember when I was in, I was driving some seminarians through Kiev. We stopped there to visit the uh, underground monastery where these monks would actually live underground their whole lives in each little cave, you know, the bars in and stuff like that. Well, the tourist, the woman guiding us, you know, was telling us about this and that. And, and, she, and she, we got into the conversation about Russian Orthodox. He said, when we had a church here, Moscow was a swamp, you know. We came way before them. So there was, there was really a I, I, think, I think the problem, Father, is we are talking about very deep-rooted tribal differences here. Yes. You know, Poles and Russians don't like each other, and they have a lot of historical reasons for that. And what we don't need to do is to get involved in, the, in, in, in that. What we do need to see is that Orthodoxy in Russia has been a conservative force, um, which, is, which is present preventing or at least making difficult the secularization of Russian culture. Now, the fact is also a nationalistic force, which means it has all sorts of, you know, anti-Polish things. Yeah, that's the stuff that goes with it. But let's not sort of just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, I agree. And the other thing on page 124, he talks about the, the uh, trope false trope that there are three Abrahamic religions. And of course, there's a truth to that, that Judaism, Catholicism, Islam all refer to Abraham as a patriarch, but we don't see him the same way. We don't see God the same way. Certainly, the relationship between Judaism and Christianity is much different than either of those with Islam, and I think it's good that he makes that point. I agree, and I've actually highlighted that the false trope, which also is great, a great phrase, the false trope. And yeah, I, I highlight it as that say passage and put in the margin, yes, exclamation mark. <laughs> okay. Uh, to your point, Joseph, about uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, you know, in the next chapter, when he talks about the Pope and world affairs, yes. and he talks about the dangerous situation with our concordat with China, you know, when there isn't an honest recognition that sometimes when the, you're dealing with church leadership, what you're actually dealing with are agents of the state government of that country. And I agree with what you're saying about Russian orthodoxy as, as, as a spiritual force in that society, but there also is this whole history that the, that the Russian clergy was in fact co-opted by uh, the KGB, of which Putin was ahead of. And so there the are of. these Political Putin was not ahead of, he was a minor official in Berlin. 
So let's not let's keep, let's get our facts straight. Oh, okay, so in any case, though, that is his history, and I don't think you do harm to uh, the ecumenical situation or the truth of the situation by at least just being honest about the political compromised situation that some of these hierarchs in these countries are in. And he uses China, you know, he when he talks about the China situation, you know, we're dealing with a similar problem. And this you is are, a problem it's that... It's chalk and cheese, Vivian. The difference between the state church in China, which was established by the communist regime, and the Russian Orthodox Church has been around for a thousand years, um, is, is not uh, the same thing at all. You have an underground legitimate church in China, which is being crushed. And you have a state church, which is sponsored by the communists, right? That's different from the Russian Orthodox Church. And what Russian Orthodox Church actually is keeping the communists at bay in Russia. Without them, you'd have national Bolshevism and everything else back again. Well, all I'm trying to point out is that sometimes these bishops and patriarchs and whatnot are politically compromised in ways different from the free societies of the West. Now, they're compromised in other ways. I'm, I'm not talking about moral compromise or compromise with the culture. I'm talking about official state control. And all I'm saying is it does no harm to just reveal on the table that sometimes with some churches you are dealing with official state interference. That's all I'm saying. I'm not going to make a bigger comparison than that, but I think it's an important point. I think you can both be right. <laughs> Uh, just two points on this chapter on the world affairs. One, we've kind of covered it here. He talks about the fact that, you know, in no case should a state authority be allowed to appoint bishops. Uh, even though in concordats in Western Europe there was a veto power. In fact, when uh, Leo XIII died, uh, the, his secretary of state, Rompola, was clearly the, the lead candidate. But the, the then Archbishop of Warsaw in Poland stood up and said, uh, by terms of the contract of the uh, Concordat, we veto that man. And so the veto, they actually had a right to veto it. They couldn't appoint someone, but they could veto. But in any event, the appointment has got to be in the hands of the church and not any national authority. That's one thing. Second thing, uh, he talks about... Uh, doing some research and, and writing uh, on what is what should Vatican diplomacy be. Now, he's very much against the Ostpolitik of Casaroli. It's happened before Vatican II and during Vatican II. Uh, but I, for, year, for years I've been saying this. I'd like to see someone do a thesis on the gospel roots of Vatican diplomacy. Because I think it would be about a two-page thesis. <laughs> Actually, Father, Father, uh, uh, when, when I was uh, editor-in-chief of Sapientia Press, which uh, you know about because we worked we were together with Ave Maria, we published a book by two Jesuits called Papal Diplomacy and the Quest for Peace, right. which was actually, you know, it's about 300 pages long and um, right. covered the last 150 years or so. I actually thought it was a very, very good book. Very good. Anything else before we talk to George Weigel? Uh, no, perhaps we could remind people of the uh, of the, the next title. I've got it right here, The Sound of Beauty by Michael Kurek. And uh, we'll probably be taking the first introduction, the first three chapters for the first session, which will be two weeks from now. We've gone over time a little bit, but it was worth it for this book. There's a lot to talk about here. Thanks, you. God bless you all for joining us. We'll see you next week. 